once again. Would you care to give your name, rank and serial numbers? I'm Martin Dolan, the Chief Commissioner of the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. I'm uh, Julian Walsh, General Manager of Strategic Capability at the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. Ian, <coughs> Ian Sangston, the General Manager of Aviation Safety <coughs> Investigation at the Australian Transport Safety Bureau. Thank you. The ATSB has lodged submission two with the committee. Do you want to make any amendments or alterations? Uh, no, Senator. We've also lodged uh, yep. several supplementary submissions yep. with the committee, but we're satisfied with the form of okay. those submissions as well. And so would you like to make a brief opening statement? Uh, I would, Senator, with your indulgence. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman and Senators, for the additional opportunity to discuss our investigation into the ditching of the West Wind VHNGA off Norfolk Island on the 18th of November 2009. At the earlier hearing, I curtailed my opening remarks in the interests of time. In the light of submissions that have been made and evidence that has been given to the committee, there are some points, however, that I would now like to make on behalf of the ATSB. The ATSB has been set up by law to improve transport safety, principally by investigating transport accidents and other occurrences, by identifying factors that have contributed to the occurrence or might affect future transport safety, that is to say, are there risks that need to be treated, communicating those factors by stating them clearly so they can be addressed, and where necessary, making recommendations and issuing safety advisory notices. We issue recommendations when we are not satisfied that su sufficient action has been taken to address identified safety factors. Our test is essentially whether we think all reasonably practicable steps have been taken to reduce the identified risk. As the committee knows, we are specifically prohibited from apportioning blame from providing the means to determine liability and from assisting in court proceedings. We are required, as you were discussing with uh, Professor McMillan, to protect information acquired or produced in the course of an investigation. We're also required to act in a manner consistent with Australia's international obligations, including under the Chicago Convention. <coughs> we undertook the investigation of the Norfolk Island accident and published an investigation report under those functions and conditions. A number of claims have been made about the inaccuracy of the investigation report or about omissions in the report. As I indicated, we have provided a range of submissions to the committee addressing the points raised. The latest was yesterday, addressing some assertions that have been made about the fuel planning and management of the accident flight. The ATSB remains satisfied that there is no material area of fact in the report. We have also satisfied ourselves that, at this stage, no significant new information has been brought to light that requires a formal reopening of the investigation. I should like to make it clear that the ATSB stands by its report. The sequence of events leading to the Norfolk Island accident could only have happened in a very narrow range of circumstances. Those cases where a flight is air work or other general aviation and where the weather, weather on arrival at destination has deteriorated significantly from that forecast on departure. These weather conditions at Norfolk Island occur one or two times a year. It did unfortunately occur in the case of this accident. The existing safety arrangements covered all other cases. All normal passenger flights and general aviation flights where the bad weather was already forecast before departure. While having regard to the, prohibi the prohibition on apportioning blame, it is necessary also to point out that the risk presented by the unforecast deterioration in Norfolk Island weather was exacerbated in this case by inadequate flight planning, carriage of less fuel than required for what had been planned, and by poor monitoring and management of the flight itself. We do not consider that the conduct of the flight met the existing standards in those areas. And we raise this as relevant because it directly affects how we assess the effectiveness of existing risk controls. Having considered all the circumstances of the accident, the ATSB concluded that there were two safety factors likely to affect future safety. That is two areas where more could be done to reduce the risk associated with similar fight flights in the future. These related to the guidance available on fuel planning and the use of weather information en route, and the operator's procedures for managing risks presented by unforecast weather deterioration. We considered that the principal source of action on the first issue was CASA, and for the second was Pell Air. Both CASA and Pell Air informed us of the action they had taken or that they proposed in response to the identified issues. The ATSB assessed the action taken or proposed and concluded that it would, did or would address the identified safety risks. For that reason, we did not 
consider it necessary to make a safety recommendation in relation to those issues. Because some of the CASA action is not complete, we will keep the safety issue open and monitor its implementation until we are satisfied that all action is finalised. I'm happy to clarify any issues ar arising from this statement or from the submissions we have made to the committee and answer any questions. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. There you go. Thanks, Chair. You, you were just saying then that you, you had no need to, you felt you had no need to do any recommendation, uh, recommendations because CASA and Pell Air um, had told you what they had done to address the issues. Yes, sir. When was that? It uh, was um, in the course of finalising the report. Um, part of the directly involved parties process, sending a draft report out with identified safety issues in it, is to seek information from those parties as to what action they have taken or proposed to take in response. So, and our aim is that by the time the report is complete, we have good information about action that is taken or proposed and can satisfy ourselves as to whether further action needs to be recommended. So it's an integral part of the way we, we run our, our process. I don't know the process. Why don't you make recommend... It sort of seems like you go, well, here are the issues, is this correct? So here, here are the issues, and Kazza and Pella have come back and said, well, this is what, we done, what we've done, mm -hmm. and then you don't make a decision about whether you need to make any recommendations until that point in time. That's correct, Okay. Senator. Has that always been the case? Uh, it's, I would have to um, check with colleagues. It certainly hasn't always been the case. It's been the case for my entire tenure, three and a half years in the organisation and it predated my arrival by a year or two, Mr. Mr. Walsh? Yeah, I think that specific approach mm. is, is, is about, about four years, uh, oh, close enough. All right. Uh, why, would, why would ATSB not make recommendations earlier on so that other parties knew exactly what would be required of them uh, to address the issues? The, the mechanism we've, uh, we've arrived at, Senator, which seems to work well, is one that looks to identify the shape of issues as early as possible and to get them sufficiently clear so that the relevant party can start proactively doing something about them before the investigation is mm. even complete. Mm. That, I take your point, but it, it doesn't really answer the question. Why would you not make recommendations earlier on, given that you are the ATSB? If there's no specific <coughs> recommendations there, aren't any, any parties really just sort of stabbing in the dark a bit to see if... If, if they're going to get their response right. Why, why would you not do it early on? You're the ATSB, you know what needs to be done. You know, you know what needs to be done to, to rectify things when, when you see a situation, regardless of what that might be. I'm, I'm just struggling as to why you wouldn't say to, to, to parties, this is what you need to do to rectify the situation. Uh, uh, there, there are two points, Senator. Where necessary, we will make recommendations in the course of an investigation, as we did in the case of Qantas Flight 32, the uncontained engine failure. Yeah, yeah. We made a very explicit recommendation to Rolls-Royce in terms of <coughs> the, the, the return to service of those engines. Mm. So it's not that we don't do it, it's that we need to be clear on the significance of the matter we're dealing with and get it clear before we make a recommendation. The second point is that the assumption has been for a considerable period of time, and I'm satisfied myself and my fellow commissioners have satisfied ourselves that we're comfortable with it. The assumption is that while the ATSB is well equipped to specify what the problem is that needs to be addressed, what is the risk that is not apparently being adequately managed, we don't always know the right way of addressing it. And those closer to controlling the event actually have a better chance of specifying the necessary action. Okay, so and that can be an iterative process. Okay, so, so in this instance, with the, the length of time, what, can you just remind me the length of time before the issuing of the draft report, from the, from the period of when the accident happened to when the draft report was issued? I uh, can't remember exactly, Senator. Can you help me, Mr. Ballpark Senator? figure, roughly? Senator, the draft was in the, sometime in the 23rd or something around there, March this year, of the this draft year. report. Somewhere oh. around there. All right. So so about two and a half years. Two, two, and, two and, and a half years. years. I think I so yep. my, I guess one of my concerns is that the draft report, having taken that long to be produced, if, as you're saying, that the parties then respond to the draft report and, and then come to you with, with how they have addressed, addressed the issue, how did they have any idea in that two and a half, how did they have any idea in that two and a half years what they were supposed to do to address the issues if they didn't have a draft yeah. report? The... 
view we formed, the provisional view we formed quite early on, Senator, was that the key set of things at issue here were the en route management of the flight. The decision making in relation to weather, management of fuel, that led to a situation where there was not a possibility of landing at Norfolk Island and insufficient fuel to go anywhere else. That this was in fact a more significant issue than what might have happened with pre-flight planning or uh, those sorts of things. And at a very early stage, we drew this very clearly and explicitly to the attention of the Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Uh, because we take a prudent view of these things, we very strongly stated what we saw as provisionally the risk that was involved here. The risk that the guidance about en route management of mm. these flights was not adequate. Okay. And isn't, isn't though the issue, and you made a judgment call that it, that it was those things you've just referred to, but, but what concerns me is, is chances are that pilot wasn't going to get in a plane and do that again. One of the bigger issues that has emerged surely is this, this fault line between the provision of information from, from New Zealand. Um, and that is something that at any period of time is, is a set of circumstances that could happen again, obviously with a, with a resultant potential dire catastrophic consequence. So isn't the fact that you identified early those, those sort of pilot issues as being the most important, isn't that, isn't that rather presumptive given that this other issue has virtually been completely overlooked? Uh, I would differ where I think with you, Senator, on the question of the overlooking of, of that issue. Um, what we took was the current provisions of the AIP and the current arrangements for the provision of weather information by air traffic services. Those provisions say in the AIP clearly principal responsibility is with the pilot to acquire weather related information including forecasts and there is some provision for um, air traffic services to proactively draw attention to the existence of an updated forecast normally in the case where aircraft are within an hour of their intended destination. But, but surely, Mr Donald, we had air services in here only two days ago um, admitting that the, the issue of the provision of from New Zealand was, was an issue that they are now going to address through the Pacific Forum, which they weren't going to do until it was raised through, yeah. through this forum. So, but you're, you're saying it's not an issue. So they're saying it is an issue, they're going to address it, but you're telling us today that you don't see it's an issue. Uh, we yeah. see a broader issue, Senator, which is what is the support that is provided to flight crews en route in terms of assessing their situation, getting access to weather and other related information, applying that to the management of their fuel and so on, okay. in a context where we saw in the AIP something that very clearly said it's responsibility of pilots to obtain information necessary to make operational decisions and that pilots will not automatically receive routine TAF information showing deteriorating weather conditions if they're en route to a location. So that's, that was the status quo with air services, with New Zealand and as we understand it with Fiji. Can I? Can I yeah, you can, uh, Chair. Ask some that's basic wooden-headed mm. questions because I've got a wooden head. Um, this is Australia's landmass, North Folk Island. It's part of our sovereignty. Uh, so I understand, Senator. Yeah. So why don't we control our own airspace? Uh, there's. It's our airspace. It's, it's not a matter that I'm an expert on, Senator, but I understand in the interests of efficient op uh, management of large areas of contiguous airspace that there's been international agreements about who provides air traffic services in what block of airspace. Norfolk Island sits yeah, inconveniently, if you yeah. like, in the middle of uh, an airspace that's mm. essentially the responsibility okay. of New Zealand. On that chair, on that chair. Could I just... Go on, if you... Just to clarify. Yeah. OK. No, no, you finish then I'll... No, no, because I'm not going to go to that. Um, I'll let you finish. So, so, so nice the airspace over, like... over our land mass is not our airspace, is that what you're saying? Uh, the airspace over Norfolk Island is controlled by the Air Traffic Service of New Zealand. Why? 
Uh, because of that agreement about efficient that, management. Anyhow, it's said that. We, that just, Sorry, the, we just get that down. It's a bit like Berlin in the middle of just, East Germany. Just get that down. Now, we were told by Air Services, no, and as <laughs> Senator Nash has pointed out, the urgency of what went wrong, and you'd hmm. agree that the non-relay of the weather from the New Zealand Bureau of whatever to our plane in their airspace, uh, or approaching our, our, our land mass, um, didn't happen. From a perspective of air transport uh, safety, we were told by air services, but he could have actually tuned into a repeater service that would give him the weather, you know, automatic repeater out of Norfolk Island. Are you familiar with that? I'm familiar with the capacity to phone the automatic service on Norfolk Island, yeah. Senator. I'm Can you call it up, though, or have you got to phone it? I'm not sure. Can anybody? So it's Can not a it's it not a UHF or VHF. My colleagues tell me, Senator, they understand that it's a matter of phoning it rather than so, calling so it. So you would have radio. to use a satellite phone, I guess. Correct, Senator. So do we know if there was a satellite phone on the plane? And should there be, by way of requirements for having a fire extinguisher, should you have a satellite phone? If you could, ha otherwise, you can't get the weather. Uh, could I perhaps put some context to this, Senator, just so we can, can understand what's going on from an ATSB perspective? Um, I would respectfully disagree with you on the question of what New Zealand might or might not have provided. The basic information that's required... Yeah, before you, just before you do mm -hmm. that, and I respectfully appreciate your answer, mm -hmm. we've got the phone which you could phone in. I, I just yes. want to get the mechanics right before we go yes. to the... So, to, um, could, could I just ask this? Mm -hmm. So if New Zealand provides information, is it the Bureau of Met in New Zealand or is it a aviation authority? It's, it actually comes... The information from the automated weather yep. service on Norfolk Island Comes in goes Australia. to the Met Bureau in yep. Australia and then is pushed yep. to a range of relevant uh, yep. providers, including the New Zealand Air Services provider and I believe the Fiji Air Services provider. So, Indeed, so it, it must be because they gave some specie and other information that would drew on so that it's, automatic. It's, it's an air services provider. They yes. then, do they transfer that with VHF or HF? HF in the, the airspace we're talking about, Senator, is my understanding. And so what is the... Could, could, we, could you provide to us the frequency of that HF yes. and the distance um, of the, um, the... Because, as you'd probably be aware, HF, depending on your frequency, can be very unreliable. Can vary, can vary depending on the time of day, Senator, mm. yes, among other things. Being an old um, HF person. So... Could, um, may I yeah, yeah. continue? The, the automated weather service provides regular updates and then also updates if there is a significant variation in the reported conditions, right. a meta or a speci. That information is automatically transmitted to the ATS providers and they are required to provide it to the crew, which is the species that we talk about and so, other things so in our report. Just, just pausing there. Mm -hmm. So in the air, in the person legally obliged to provide that updated information from the mm -hmm. auto into Australia over to there, yep. um, do they have a fixed uh, instrument in the plane to receive that or do they have to turn it on to receive it? The communication is on a specified high frequency yep. arrangement HF, uh, which yep. um, gets changed. I think there's a, a sequence of them to go through if, if you're not getting adequate reception. But the basic communication is a high frequency communication with the air traffic control centre. On one frequency or several? I believe it's available on several. There are a number of frequencies available, Senator. That will pick it up. And, and generally what crews will do is, um, in my experience, you'd start at the lower numbers at the beginning of the day and as the day progressed, you would get into the higher numbers of frequencies. And, and the distance. It's to do with propagation and, and so on. And that's about so, the level. So as part of the flight plan, this young pilot would have 
known the frequencies, had the radio to tune into those frequencies, and as part of his flight, you know, like you switch from air traffic control if you're flying into Sydney yes. from one logger to somewhere. Exactly that, Senator. Um, and, and that's so what you, we would he expect. would have had to have tuned in and had the radio on and been able to receive. Yep. Yep. And there are several cases where we've got confirmation that specie information was transmitted and received by and received, like, and received. by the pilot. The, by the pilot the confirmed by confirmed by the flight crew, Senator, that they received this information. Can you provide that to the committee? Uh, it's in our report, Senator. Um, mm. We. Uh, There's some dispute about that. Sorry, through your chair. Mm. There's some dispute about what was received <laughs> at what time, isn't there? Mm. Uh, in the evidence. There's no dispute in the information we put in our draft report as factual information and provided to the flight crew and others involved. They agreed with the information as we specified it in our report, Senator. I can't hear you. Sorry, Mr. Dodd. I'm, no, I'm sorry, Senator. Can I get it up a bit, please? Thank you. I'm, sorry, what did you say then? I'm, a naturally quiet spoken person, I apologise. Uh, you're not married well, to me. And quietly spoken. The oh, sorry, Fiona. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sorry, I, I got, I've taken a little off track. In, in our report, Senator, which was based, among other things, on interviews with the flight crew, mm -hmm. we specified those times when specie and other information, METAR information, was provided to, transmitted to the aircraft and received by the crew and acknowledged by the, recruit, the crew as having been received. Can you tell us, I know it's in the report, but sorry about why the Chair is talking to the Secretary, how many times there was that information passed and received? Uh, and over what period of time, Mr Dole? We, it's, if you've got the report with you, Senator... Um, I left it in my other bag. Uh, the sorry, problem... Chair, may it, through you, mm. it's directly supplementary to, to Senator Still's line of questioning in terms of who, who understood what. My understanding was that it was denied by both the pilot in command and the first officer. It was denied uh, in the reenactment by both pilots, so they actually heard the cloud level. Uh, and I understand there was a video uh, reenactment of that. I'm not sure if, we've if the committee's received that. We have it. Yeah, I haven't had a chance mm -hmm. to see it. But my, my understanding was that directly relevant to what Senator Still has asked, that, the, 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 that as I understand it, the pilots were, were quite uh, uh, shocked, at, you know, that they, they said that they didn't hear it um, um, and that there was uh, uh, yeah. a, a look of surprise on their faces when, when faced with that information. True, Senator, and we, we say Sorry, that... say that's true? We, we say that in our report. What we say in our report, which I think is consistent with the facts, is that especially observation at that point was received but not assimilated by the flight crew. And we, there is an acknowledgement by the flight crew of receipt of the information and indeed a thank you to air traffic control for the information having been provided. But, but, but did they mishear the information? Is that still in contention? As, no, we would agree, Senator, with what the crew told us, which is at that point, at around about just after 8 p.m., 0800 uh, UTC, rather, sure. yeah. um, that the information had been transmitted, the information had been received and acknowledged, but the, the crew did not understand the significance of the information they had received. Did, did they then get an 8.30 update which they assimilated? Uh, the next speci, uh, Senator, uh, was transmitted sometime after 0900 um, UTC. Uh, so, sorry, Chair, Chair, mm. Chair there's, there's, there's a fundamental issue here. Um, uh, Mr Dolan, is quite, you're quite correct in saying that the crew acknowledge the information they received, but the question in contention is what information do they think they received because of the nature uh, of the, uh, the high frequency, the, the, the HF, and Fiji and air traffic control as I understand it, which had a, didn't provide a recording, or, or we don't really actually know what they, what they heard, the quality of what they heard, because uh, even if the cockpit voice recorder was retrieved, it wouldn't have been within that two hour loop, is that correct? That's correct, Senator. So, so let's just be clinical about this. Mm -hmm. um, they acknowledged receipt of information, but what they, what, uh, they heard 
could be subject to the vagaries of HF. Uh, excuse me, if I may interject there, I think I might be able to shine some light on this. If I'm understanding you correctly, and I've got a bit of sailing experience, so I think the same thing applies when you get um, weather forecasts over radio. You can hear a weather report that says um, the wind shifted to whatever and it's gone to this particular height. You receive that information, but you may not necessarily twig in your head that's really serious. So it's not that you haven't heard what's been said, it's that you haven't interpreted it correctly. That's that's what I think you're trying to say. Um, rather certainly, than, Senator, yes, that's... Rather than something was said and the person misheard it, they've heard it, they've acknowledged it, but failed to recognise perhaps... What we intended by the expression received but not assimilated did not, yeah. well, did not understand the consequences of the information yeah. received. Well, Chair, sorry, further to what Senator... Senator Thorpe is, is quite right in what she said, but... Is there another potential scenario in that we don't know because there is no recording of what was actually what was actually heard by them by virtue of the of the two hour loop and, and it wasn't recovered, correct? Uh, that's correct, Senator. In other words, the recording of what was transmitted at the point of transmission does not necessarily mean it, it is what they it is what they actually heard. I mean I'm, I'm just yeah. asking that you consider that as a potential scenario. I I, I can certainly consider it as a scenario, Senator, the thing that weighs against it, in my mind, is the explicit acknowledgement of the receipt of the information. No, no, well, well, no I just want to be fair here. They explicitly acknowledge the information, but we, but, but because of the vagaries of HF, uh, HF can be distorted. Is that right? Uh, yes, Senator, uh, it can. Right. And how do you explain the fact that when there is a, a, a video, as I understand it, a video of the, the, the pilot in command and the first officer, that they both expressed surprise at when the recording was played back to them, which would have obviously been a clear recording because it would have come out of Fiji Air Traffic Control. I'm just trying to clarify that. Auckland, in fact, Can I just attempt to assist Please the do. committee? Do I understand it correctly that at the Fiji Mm -hmm. said that the cloud was at 6,000 feet and should have said 600. Uh, there's, there's two things, Senator. There was a request, um, first of all, for weather at Norfolk Island where Fijian air traffic control did specify the wrong cloud height. What time was that? That was just before the transmission of this speci. When you say just before, how far before? About 30 seconds before, Senator. Right. So, so, so it's clear up straight away. The mistake, sorry. The so the, the mistake was that there was uh, false information and the, then it was cleared up. There was incorrect information, Senator. Uh, immediately thereafter, there was a transmission, which, as, Sen as, as Senator Xenophon has said, from New Zealand, or from, have, Fiji. Yeah, so from I, I Fiji. Apologize. No, well, mm. the information I received is it was actually, is it possible that it was actually recorded by New Zealand's quite it large was, receiver? That's, that's Auckland, right, Senator. But, but the crew's, uh, you know, relatively puny aerial doesn't hear it the same as the New Zealand recording. Um, it wouldn't be the same recording quality, would it? That's pretty axiomatic, uh, isn't the, it? I would only say two things, Senator, which is just there's a lot of, of detail here. My understanding is in the West Wind, it wouldn't be a reasonable description of the aerials to say they're relatively puny, that they're in fact uh, quite reliable HF aerials and uh, certainly the transmission both to and from the aircraft that was recorded by Auckland doesn't appear to show any distortion. Recognise it may have been different in the cockpit. Um, but, but just to get it into my yeah. block, mm -hmm. air traffic or whatever at Fiji said, called up whatever the flight is and said, clouds at 6,000. The, yeah, as we say and, in the report. And who so then 30 mm -hmm. seconds later said, oops, yeah. 600. No, it wasn't. Sorry, Senator, it wasn't with respect. Oops. Uh, the error in the meta, the routine weather report that was transmitted that said 6,000, that said the wrong height, the wrong how, uh, cloud height, was overtaken by the speci. What does that mean? Yeah, but wait, oh, sorry, a meta, a Senator. A, a, there's a there's a routine report that's transmitted on a regular basis. You know, no, the meta. Look, look, just on, chair. direct. No, no, I'm chairing. Chair. Direct yeah. yourself to my head. Uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. Uh, uh, 
Fiji transmits the wrong altitude, correct? Uh, at, could I perhaps read from the report, yeah. Senator? Yeah, no, no, but just, yeah, this no, is really no, 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 Chair, please, no. this is really important. Could Mr Dolan read the two transmissions into the handset? So we've got the first one and then the second one well, into the well, handset. Well, no, before you do that, the Fiji transmission to the aircraft, whatever it said, how was that transmitted? By HF, by telephone, by carrier pigeon? How did the plane get the message from, from Fiji? By HF radio transmission. On the same frequency that New Zealand was tuned into? They're running the line at the uh, It would have been one of the frequencies that New Zealand was tuned into, Senator, yes. Yeah, and and correction, <laughs> some seconds later, was transmitted to the plane from where, by who? Uh, from Fiji, uh, by HF radio. On the same frequency? On the same frequency, by right. the same controller. Back to you, Senator. And the only point I'd make, Senator, is that this was not a correction. That the inaccurate cloud height information from the META mm -hmm. was not corrected. What happened was an updated report, right. a specie, okay. was then transmitted okay. a short time later. Right. Is it possible to read both of those into the handset for us? Uh, it's Appendix A to the report, Senator. Would you like me to just read just the report? It take two hours. Is it, how, how long is it? It's a page in okay. the report. All right. We'll just we'll yeah. note that. Can you say in the second, as you say, it wasn't mm. a correction, it was a second it was mm -hmm. a second report. At any accurate. stage did the second report refer to the first report as having been incorrect? Uh, no, sir. No. So therefore the pilot in listening to a report almost immediately after the first one had no way to be alerted to the fact that there was a significant difference in the height of the cloud. I'm just saying that because if I'm mm. if I'm driving along and I hear a weather report on the radio and then I hear another one a minute later, I'm going to assume that they are almost exactly the same because of the shortness of time. Uh, so, so hang on, just just come with me for a second here. So, so given the the couple of minutes I think you said between the two, why would the pilot assumed that there was a, an extraordinarily significant, significant difference in a second report when there was nothing in that that would alert him to the fact that it was in any way, shape or form catastrophically different to the first one. I, and I, sorry, and, let me, and, and I say that in your, going back to your earlier comments, that your understanding is that the pilot received it. Yeah, at, well, at, absolutely, in some way, shape or form. We're not sure of the quality because of the HF that the chair refers to. But surely you would have to take into account that there would be nothing in the pilot's brain that would trigger the catastrophic difference between those two, given that they were so close um, in time. And the second report did not refer to the fact that the first one was incorrect. Uh, there's, there's probably one point to, to be made there, Senator. Um, to take your road parallel, the equivalent would be if the second report you received said urgent weather update. Because what, in transmitting the second report, the air traffic controller said was, contacted the aircraft and then said, this is the latest weather for Norfolk Specy, I say again, special weather Norfolk at 0800 Zulu. Now, Specy means there has been a significant shift in the weather conditions at the reporting site. That's what Specy means. And Specy, I say again, Specy is the message that went through. Right, and then the pilot said thank you or Roger or whatever. Thank you, Nandi. Much appreciated, November Golf Alpha. Yeah, can I just say Chair, can I just directly on, because there's an issue of, of who heard what. Mm. Um, how many times did the pilot in command uh, or the first officer say, say again? Can I suggest to you it was said on a number of occasions in the transcript? Uh, it's one time, according to our transcript, it's one time, Senator, I think. I think it was several times to Fiji. Uh, in, wouldn't it? in this, uh, are we talking about this specific? No, I'm saying two in the transcript that you have in terms of the, the communications with Fiji, mm -hmm. that the pilot actually said on several occasions, "Say again," 
if a pilot says, say again, does that indicate to you perhaps, perhaps a lack of clarity or some communications problem? We're assuming that Mr James's hearing uh, was, uh, uh, was reasonable, uh, assuming that he has relatively normal hearing. If a pilot says on several occasions, say again, would that tend yep. to indicate some form I've, of communications problem? I've only got a partial transcript in front of me, Senator, so could you I'm happy take, to take it on well, notice. Could you and take what? it on notice? And furthermore, mm. if the if there were uh, if it's if it's shown that there were several occasions when the pilot said, "Say again," would that tend mm. to uh, be indicative of yep. some form of communications issue? Yep. Um, Is that what a yes we have or in our, no? Yes, I'm happy to take that on notice and get back but to but you. But would you Senator. agree that if if someone keeps saying Say again to if air traffic control. Does that indicate that could that indicate some sort of problem? Uh, it, it could indeed, Senator. The same take if they say thank you. They've got it clear. Um, you just say again. The uh, uh, we so we will we'll take it on that, as Senator. Um, the point I make on the transcript that's available to me. The only reference we have to say again is. A transmission by the aircraft to Nandy saying, having completed that first weather update, the Met are, uh, copy, just say again the issue time for the Met are. So, specifically, there appears to have been some problem in either understanding or hearing the transmission time, the issue time for the Met are. And how long was that before the Specy? Uh, that was at uh, 08. So two and the space uh, zero eight oh two and eight seconds. The speci was zero eight oh two and thirty two seconds. So the speci was okay. less than thirty seconds later. Yes, could have diverted to Numia. In that thirty twenty second uh, gap, we by the reconstruction of the fuel planning and fuel consumption for the flight, Senator, are very confident that there could have been a successful diversion at that point and indeed at several other points up until probably about 09.30 Zulu. And, and Numia does have ILS? It does, Senator. And Norfolk doesn't? No. Numia has a what? I didn't hear that. An instrument ILS. landing site, Senator. Uh, uh, sorry? Uh, an ILS. Landing system. Uh, instrument landing system. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah. Um, All right. I've still got questions. Yeah, so we've still got time. Beauty. Can, can I just, all right, that, that clears that up. Thanks, Mr. Dolan. Now, you were talking about the two safety factors being guidance, I'll have to try and get my hand shorthand, but fuel, fuel and, and weather risk is what you talked about. And you've, okay, we've covered the weather risk. In terms of the fuel, do you have the figures that the pilot used on his way to pick up the patient and then like, was there fuel? Where were the fueling stops when he left Australia to get to? Where was the patient? Numia or um, Samara? Uh, I don't. I'm not sure whether we have the fuel on. So the the flight was, as I recall, and Mr. Sangston can correct me if I got it wrong. Sydney, Norfolk Island, um, up here in Western Samoa to pick up the pilot. Yep. And then the return was planned over Norfolk to pick up fuel in Norfolk and then to Melbourne. Okay, so and so difference. on the outward flight, there was re a landing and a refuelling at Norfolk Island. Do you have the fuel that was put on at Norfolk Island? How many litres or gallons to get to Western Samoa? We'd have, we'd have that available. To we'd us we'd have that available, but not in the report. Okay. Got, I'm just trying to establish. I know that there was extra passengers on the way back. I get all that. So I'm interested mm -hmm. to know if the pilot, in your view, had enough fuel for the weight that he was carrying, as per the weather conditions that he was told, or. Because I want to clarify, you, I'm of the belief I heard that you said that he could have carried more fuel. Uh, the report for the return trip. The report says that uh, there was a capacity to load more fuel and a tip thanks to the aircraft senator. Now, yes. does it have any? And Stephen, I'm waiting for you to keep me on the table if I say the wrong thing. But in terms of the fuel usage, it would be calculated at a certain height. The, um, the, the plane would travel. There's in the. Operations manual and the flight manual of the aircraft, there's a range of information and facilities for calculation to work out fuel consumption on climb, on cruise at different levels, at different weights, and so on, Senator. And did you, when you were doing your report, did you look at the uh, uh, height that, say, air services would have allowed the 
plane to travel at? Do the uh, fuel calculations? We um, we did a number of fuel calculations, Senator. Um, we also looked at the heights that the aircraft operated at, both its intended initial cruise height and the one that it was given by air traffic control after negotiation to climb to. All of which, so um, the planned flight was at 35,000 feet. Yep. Uh, air traffic control then said, I'm sorry, Senator, I should probably be referring to the report rather than relying on my somewhat aging memory. Um, oh, you uh, but uh, at flight level 390, which was what it, so on climb to the cruising height of 35,000 feet and then established, um, air traffic control at a later point said, we've got crossing traffic and we would like you to go down to uh, 270, 27,000 feet. Yeah. The pilot said, I would prefer to go to flight level 390, which go is higher. higher where uh, you've consumed less fuel because the air's thinner and a range of other things. Yep. Air traffic control agreed to that. There was a climb to that level and crews at that level, I believe, until descent Under into range, yeah. Norfolk Island. And the, so there's fuel yeah. calculations and fuel burns that go with, with those sorts of movements. So would it be that the pilot would, obviously the pilot spoke to air traffic control and said, this is how many gallons I have on board and this is the reason why I need to fly at a different level than what you first... Uh, all that's all taken into consideration? Uh, I'm not sure how detailed the pilot was in his request to go up rather than down, but, but was, that was the context for the right, request. But there was no restriction from air traffic control to allow the pilot to change the level that he was on. No. It was, it was all agreed to and it was okay, by air traffic so control. Okay, great. So you're going to provide to us the fuel that was... Are you able to provide to us the fuel that was... Yes used or uh, topped up or whatever the term. You use all these acronyms, you fly boys, you've got me buggered. But anyway, uh, when you filled up Norfolk Island. On the way out, yep. Senator. And then yes. the fuel coming back and compare the weight for us because everyone's an expert. You see, they all throw things at this, like you've got in front well, of you. And we threw that at you, Okay, and we really need the assistance of the experts. Well, everyone's mm. an expert, so there you go. But just so, to make sure. So can I just ask, Mr hey? Dolan, and thank you for your patience, um, if the pilot, I mean, I think we took evidence, and I'd have to go back to the transcript, and I apologise if I've got it wrong, that when the plane took off to come back to Australia with the patient, the fuel load may not have fitted <laughs> specifications for that flight. Yet when it land, when it attempted its landing at Norfolk, it was legal the fuel load. Is that um, the there are. I'm sorry, Senator, this is going to be a rather lengthy answer, so please bear with me. The flight, to the extent there was flight planning, the planning was on the basis of a direct flight to Norfolk Island, having no regard to possible yep. diversion or other uh, or alternate aerodromes. So in calculating the fuel necessary for that flight, the requirement was to find where essentially the point of no return is, calculate the fuel that would be necessary to get from the point of no return to the intended destination, Norfolk Island, and then do a range of other calculations and then work out a fuel load. By those calculations, we have formed the view that it would have been necessary to fully load the, or as close Mm. as possible, fully load the aircraft with fuel, use the tip tanks, and having done so, that would have met the requirements for that planned flight. The tip tanks were not filled on departure, Senator. So if they had have been, and the same thing had happened, what would have happened? Uh, there would have been more fuel above Norfolk Island, and there would have been would more fuel at various points. Would that have got him to Newmere, though, or would have got him into the sea off Newmere? Um, by our calculations, Senator, at round about 0930 um, UTC, there was still sufficient fuel on board that aircraft to, for a decision to have been made to divert to La Tontuta at Numea. So, so was that it? Been if the tip tanks yeah, were Stolen, could you, yeah. Do you mind repeating that? Um, yeah. By our calculations, Senator, 
0930 is approximately oh, right. Um, no, we actually did um, 0928 UTC because that's the point at which yeah. the the specie that said the landing minima are now no longer there for Norfolk Island. At that point, by our, our calculations, with the aircraft could have diverted to La Tontuta at Noumea and arrived with the fixed fuel reserve intact on the basis that they would encounter 90 knot headwinds. With the fuel that he had on board, not no, no, correct. No, with the tank. No, yes, no, no. No, no this that's is a different With the fuel on board, Jim. With the fuel oh, on board. So he, he ditched oh, yeah. when he oh. shouldn't have. The, instead of diverting, making a decision to divert to Norfolk Island, um, uh, to Tontuta, uh, to Noumea, the decision was made. Um, the decision was made to attempt to land on the understanding that it was likely the conditions were not quite as bad as reported or there would be the ability to get through. So, so when he made his first aborted attempt to land at Norfolk, mm -hmm. according to your calculations, if he said, I'm out of here, I'm going to be mayor, no, he wouldn't No, that it. wouldn't have worked, Senator. No. The decision would have made, need, needed to be made before dissent. Yeah. Chair, can I, can, I, can, I, can I put an alternative scenario to, to Mr. Dolan? Mm -hmm. um, Going back a step in terms of Senator Stirl's line of questioning, my understanding is that the pilot in command had full fuel on the way over because the weather required it, that is on the way from Norfolk Island to Samoa. But if he had full fuel on the way back, he would have had difficulty in climbing to 39,000 feet because of our RVSM, is that correct? Uh, not because of RVSM, uh, Senator. What is RBS? Uh, sorry, uh, that's it's, it's, the, well, the ac it's an acronym for vertical separation. Reduced. Air, yeah, reduced vertical separation. It it's, too heavy, doesn't it? Um, yeah. the, so to, to deal with the, the two points, reduced vertical separation minima is a provision in a, a range of airspace that lets appropriately equipped aircraft operate there and operate effectively closer to each other than you would otherwise be able to do. The aircraft, the Westwind, was not equipped with that, but aeromedical flights are explicitly allowed to operate in this RVSM airspace. Okay. The difference between 35,000 feet Sorry. and 39,000 feet, as the Senator says, is that with a full fuel load, the aircraft could only have climbed to 35,000 feet and until it had burned off a substantial amount of fuel at which point it could then have gone to 39,000. Because you burn more fuel at a lower altitude. Correct, Correct, Senator. And so it's likely, with a full fuel load, at the point where air traffic control said, we want you to go down, that that would have been a requirement. And that, as the crew told us on the reconstruction, would have led to their seriously rethinking, as you'd expect, yep. their options. Uh, but that wasn't the way this played out. That went up. So it could get up. They did, uh, they did get up to 39,000 feet. But if they'd been fully loaded, that option probably wouldn't have been there. That's correct, sir. So, so if they'd have filled the fuel tanks, mm -hmm. and, I mean, we can all be wise after the event, yeah. and they had gone to Norfolk and thought, oh, my God, would they have had enough fuel to go to New Um we, It would have been even... Well, on the assumption that they'd made a first attempt to land and then climbed again and gone all the way, that's going to chew up a lot of fuel. Yeah. Our best assessment, Senator, is they could have done it with a full fuel load, but they would have actually eaten into their fixed reserve. They would have had to declare a fuel emergency. What was the fly? Sorry, can I just ask what the flying time is from Norfolk to hmm. um, Noumea? So the I'm, I'm, the flying, I'm sorry, Senator? So the flying time from Norfolk to, to Noumea? Uh, no, for, for that, for, for what they've calculated for that fuel use, yeah, I understand it, you know, yeah. that. Uh, about four hours <laughs> from from Norfolk to. Oh, sorry, from Norfolk Island to Namibia. Uh, I'm I'm told of something over an hour, about an hour and ten minutes for the. An hour and ten minutes. Yes. May I, Chair? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a couple of things. You mentioned earlier the first draft of your report was about the 23rd of March. Some, somewhere around there. Somewhere. And the final report, August? 30 August, I think it was. Yeah. And there were several iterations in between. 
They were, Senator. Did each of those drafts and further iterations um, contain recommendations? Uh, there's not any point that I'm familiar with in the process of the report, Senator, uh, where the report included a recommendation. Until? The report, at no point that I'm aware of, has included a recommendation. Right. Mr Sangston, are you aware of any no, Senator, reports in any of the drafts? No, Senator. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Senator Thorpe. That's all right. Just... I'm just, just trying to establish... Yeah. We are at, at a, from the initial draft stage, Senator, we specified a number of safety factors and some safety issues. Uh, but the process, of course, is having identified the safety issues, we then seek information of, as to what has been done to address them and assess that action and then determine whether it's necessary to make a recommendation, i.e. is there something that still needs to be done that is not being done. Okay. Chair, I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly confused about this because my understanding is wasn't he... Three. No, I'm wrong. Right. I'm fine. Charlie, you leave. Isn't, isn't there an issue? Uh, Sorry, I was talking to you. said clear as mud? It's labour speed. Wasn't the pilot in command asked to descend to 27,000 feet at one point or 28,000 feet? Yes, sir. Why was he asked to descend to that point? Because there was crossing traffic. So he didn't right. bump into anyone else. But he couldn't have got. But but that would have made it very difficult for him because he wouldn't have had. He would have burned up too much much fuel at 27,000 feet. Yeah. Correct, sir. Which right. is why I asked to go up. And that's why I asked to go up. Yes, sir. But if he had a so for the Senator Thorpe's line of questioning, mm -hmm. if his wingtips, if he had 100% fuel, he would have had trouble getting up to that. That's correct, sir. Given he had passengers, the, the patient, the yes. doctor, it's, uh, the, the, the patient and her yeah. husband. There would have been a period of about an hour, as I recall, but others can inform me. Would, hmm. would, would, in terms of what, I mean, doesn't New Zealand AIP uh, prohibit, uh, you know, flying in that range of 28 to 39,000 feet? No, Senator. So what does it, what does it, it prohibit? It, it says that, um, one, appropriate equipped aircraft, of course, can use RVSM airspace at any time. That other aircraft can use RVSM airspace with four hours notice, but may have to be um, directed from that airspace if it conflicts with other traffic. Could you and that, a, If I could yeah, just complete, sure, please. Senator. And that air ambulance work, which was how the New Zealand rules saw this operation and it was defined in their air traffic control system, are immediately allowed into that airspace and allowed to operate in it. Could you, would you mind on notice, just provide us with that specific section of the, the specific regulations yeah. in, in respect yeah. to that? Is, is, it in, is it in the we report? Put it in, put it I, I think it's, I th no, I believe it's in one of our supplementary submissions, Senator, but we'll, um, we'll make sure that uh, oh, it's further copy supplied. Oh, if it's our, our very capable yeah. secretary will dig that up, so that's yeah. fine. If it's, as long as it's in the supplementary submission, we'll dig it up. Can I put to your proposition, Mr Dolan, that, that the pilot could have diverted to Fiji up until 0845, uh, but past that point he was committed to Norfolk Island. That Numir was a problem because of the, because of the, you know, the the issues with the with the Numir or the French Aviation Authority in terms of equipment. But he didn't have the fuel to Numir when he realised that at 0900 the weather at Norfolk was uh, was getting worse. Uh, that's where. It appears we're in disagreement, Senator, because our assessment is with the fuel that was actually loaded, um, not the fuel that could have been loaded, the fuel that actually was loaded, at 0900 UTC, it would have been entirely possible for the aircraft to divert successfully to New Caledonia and to arrive with the fixed reserve intact. Without declaring an emergency? Period. With no need to declare an emergency. So he had enough fuel on board to be able to divert. By our calculations, Can I just, just really quick on that, on the, the actual reports that we're giving, and you said there was one just before eight o'clock and just, sorry, mm -hmm. nine, nine o'clock and just after were the ones we were talking about before. Uh, is, there, is there a standard period of time that they, that they are issued? Is it every hour or, because there wasn't one between eight and nine o'clock, was there? Mm. Six hours per day. Are mm -hmm. they, I'm, so I just want to clarify. By, by is there a standard? Is there there is a, a standard reporting period. And what is that? Um, 
so the metas are updated every every half an hour. So, so why wasn't there one at eight thirty? Uh, Given that that eight forty five hmm. seems to be the timing issue, why wasn't there one at eight thirty? I can't confirm whether there was or wasn't, Senator. It no, no, no. Just... I'm sure Mr Dolan told me no. earlier that there was one at... There was one at... Eight, was a... eight, but then not, uh, not till the what two at nine o'clock. What we focused on in... No, 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 sorry, I just want to, I just want to yeah. clarify this before we move on to the... I'm, mm. I, and I'm, if I've got you wrong, Mr. Do Mr Dolan, sorry, but I'm, I thought you said earlier that there was one at eight and then there mm. were those two on either side of that nine o'clock or whenever. Uh, yes, uh, but we should... Was that... um, Understand the difference, Senator, between routine reports, the METARs, and the species, the reports that say yeah, yeah, there's no, been no, no, a significant I've got that, variation. But, but, but if you're saying one of those, excuse my layman, but one of those should happen at 30 minute intervals, why wasn't there one at 8.30? Uh, this is what we're, we're checking, Senator. We understand there was, but we'll have to confirm All that. All right, we'll go back to if you, could, if you could provide that on, on right. notice as quickly as you can, that would be great, thanks. All right. I've got a question, Chief. Gave you that. Thank you. So, Mr. Dolan, for those of us who aren't pilots, and I'll talk about us truckies, we go down the road and we are taught from our very first time we step into a cab of a truck to watch our dials, keep an eye on our gauges, and if a warning light comes on, there's something wrong. So, is it, am I right to assume the way you were telling us that if there is a specie that comes over the radio, this is not like all of a sudden it's a music radio and I like this song, I'll turn it up. Am I right that when pilots actually are tuned to hear, and if they um, hear it or they don't hear it, is it their duty straight away to clarify? Uh, I wouldn't say it was their duty, uh, Senator. I would have thought it would be prudent. Um, but this goes to the reason we identified a safety issue to do with the guidelines and information available to support decision making, whether information is so on in flight. Uh, the, the detailed information on what you need to do uh, is not brought together in one place and is not as clear as it should be. So there's one element to your answer. The second is that the species we're talking about were essentially saying that the clouds are still OK at the location for there to be a reasonable likelihood of a safe landing. Yep. But if you are planning your flight, you should have in mind your alternate aerodrome. That's what the species were saying up until 0928, at which point yep. it said the yep. clouds are Clouds are awful. You're not going to get in. Yes. Yeah, 928, which is all too late. Uh, as well, I've said, Senator, we, no. we we don't necessarily share that view. You didn't so, say that at all in your so your nine, report. Nine, was it 928? There was enough mm. fuel in your yes, calculation. That's our calculation. To and, and just to clarify, I think you said it was 945 was the cutoff point. Is that correct? Oh, uh, hour, yeah. We, I don't think, took the calculations beyond about 09. Two eight, Senator, okay. because that seemed to us to All be right. the critical point for a decision. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go back to... You've got plenty of time. Calm down. Um, I want to go back to something else. Um, the report... You generally report these incidents in a year. Our target is to complete most yeah. investigations within and a year. What was this one? Three years? Three years, Senator. Can you tell us why it took three years? Uh, there's a range of reasons, Senator. At the time that this happened, um, we had a lot of investigations on hand, including several major ones. Um, yeah. We had over 100 investigations on hand, and of those, three were major. There was um, Papua New Guinea, um, the uh, Kokoda accident. There was Qantas Flight 72, the in-air pitch down that was very complicated and led to injuries to 100 passengers. There was another level two. Which in other words, your resources were stretched. Our resources were stretched, Senator, right. and we so were they, trying they, to yep. direct All them right. to a range of priorities. All right. so uh, but we did set ourselves the standard for this sort of investigation of one year, and we failed to meet it. All right. So then there was talk that at a mid-level, whatever that means, there was a view that this was a critical safety incident. Uh, in the early stages, Senator, and 
I wouldn't have said it was mid-level. I believe Mr Sangston um, signed off the initial letter. Um, at a quite early stage in this, we drew it to the attention of CASA to what, on a provisional basis, we thought could was be... Was a critical safety could, issue. Could be a critical safety issue. All right. Issue. Now, now, just... What critical safety issue says is that there was an intolerable risk, correct? Correct, Senator. And, Mr Sangston, in your view, you thought there was a reasonable chance it was a critical safety incident? Based on the information we yep. had. Yes, Senator. Which at was an intolerable risk. At the time and on the information. And, and yet, through a series of twos and fro's, it went down to a minor safety incident, which was a broadly acceptable risk. How in God's name can you go from intolerable to acceptable? Uh, we would like to see the paper trail and the communications that made that happen. Uh, if I could start, Senator, and perhaps Mr Sangston... Is there a paper trail? Uh, there's an exchange of correspondence with, with CASA on this. There's our initial letter. Could, and could we response. see the paper trail? Uh, absolutely, Senator. It's in the material we've provided, yeah, but, but we I mean, can select a, it out and, and make it available separately. Yeah, but, but yeah, we've got a uh, container uh, load. Could hard, we just have... A, hard, a searchable hard disk, Senator, um, but we'll make sure the information is provided. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, well, the Senator still said we'd like the dates to give us some guidance when it went from... Yep, yeah. but we'll... Boxes and boxes. Happy to, happy to provide it separately, Senator. So, so would it be fair to say that it went from intolerable to broadly acceptable after being counselled by CASA? Uh, having regard, among other things, to information provided to us by CASA... Yes, Senator. Um, the... Wow. Wow. At, at an early, I must personally say uh, that this was early in my time in the in the ATSB. They put it over you. Uh, that I would not have assessed even at that stage that it was a critical safety issue. I would have thought that prudently we would have said it was significant. Uh, however, what, the, what the, the record mid... shows is it was identified as a critical safety issue. But in yep. your opinion, it wasn't. Uh, by reviewing the material... You were new on the block, no. but Mr Sangston, were you new on the block when you thought it was critical? Uh, I'd been in the job about six months, Senator, at the time. So do you, do you think maybe, having been counselled by CASA, that you'd ha be happy to call it significant, which is the mid-shot? There was no counselling by CASA, Senator. Hey, that's a terminology of mine. Sorry, counselling, perhaps another word, uh, <laughs> after consultation with CASA? We... Uh, as per the um, documentation, we did have a meeting with CASA and we expressed our, um, at the time, understanding of a, t a potentially critical safety issue. We talked through it and CASA wrote back to us about, I think, just over a month later and gave us their position. That informed some other areas that we, we then looked at and as we developed our understanding, the level of risk changed. So is that fair to say that you were wrong? that you couldn't tell the difference between intolerable and broadly acceptable risk? No, Senator. As I think Mr Dolan said, we take a conservative view initially yeah, and on, on the evidence we had, we understood it to be... An, a and, and did the evidence change? The evidence and understanding and application... No, no. Of, did the evidence change? Was there any new evidence came to light? No, no, did, no, no, I'm doing this. Did the evidence change? Certainly, we looked more widely at the aeronautical information. Did the evidence change? In terms of the documentation, yes, Senator. So understanding of the evidence. No, 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 no. The evidence. Not your understanding, the evidence. The evidence. Change. Well, the, the evidence was in the publication, yeah, Senator. No, did the did evidence change? change? Not how you interpreted the evidence. Did the evidence change? No, but our awareness... Thank you very much. The awareness... That's all I need to know. Thank you. So the, your interpretation of the evidence changed? Our understanding and interpretation of the application of the evidence to this circumstance changed. Does that mean, with great respect, if CASA thought it was in your discussions that they were able to get you to say it was broadly acceptable for intolerable, that you didn't know what your job was? 
don't, don't, no, you know what I mean. I, I don't mean that personally. Six months on the job. Well, I mean, I mean it's a mystery if to someone standing at the back of the room there that's listening to all this, how someone that's got the job that all Australians who travel rely on the Air Transport Safety Bureau, that a senior officer, um, you know, dedicated and fair dinkum, could, could review his position from intolerable to broadly acceptable. If I could perhaps um, try and add some information to that, Senator. As we tried to make clear, there was an initial assessment of the evidence we had available to us, which was essentially about decision making mm. on route and what informed it and everything else. The guidance that was available, whether it was reliable, and given that this had potentially been a disaster, that there had potentially been six fatalities in this accident and it was only fortuitous that there were not, uh, we gave a very significant weight to any issue that was associated with this. And so we were saying to CASA, this was almost a six fatality accident. Mm. Here is what we seem at the initial stages to be a problem, and in the context of this accident, we think it's significant. Mm. Pay attention. CASA paid serious attention to it, gave us a response, which led us to further lines of inquiry to better understand what was at issue, the safety issue that we had identified. Mm. And we continued to review it, and it remains in the report as a safety issue, but not at the level but of intensity. But in the meantime, while, while on, with no change of the evidence, you've repositioned yourself from intolerable to broadly acceptable, Correct. the chief pilot, whatever, from Hell Air happens to go and work for CASA, just by way of the incidental that happened, didn't it? Uh, so I understand, Senator. Yeah, yeah. So which could, could thing? Sorry, Jeff, could you provide... I oh, know it's probably all in this pile of mountain of stuff, but could you provide that response from CASA you were just talking about? No. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, so we, we'd be interested, with no change in the evidence, what convinced you that what you yeah. thought was intolerable mm. was acceptable, uh, broadly? Yeah, and you can see where we ended up in the report, Senator, was we still said there's a safety issue here. Uh, we've said the safety issue goes to what the AIP and other information says about what pilots should do in circumstances where the weather deteriorates over the course of the flight. And we weighed that up again in our normal procedures at the end of the investigation to say what's the likelihood of a recurrence okay. and what's the consequence of a recurrence right. of this so and viewed the issue in that light, which is in accordance mm, with our yeah. procedures. Anyhow, oh, I understand you may be in a difficult position with some of this. Um, the, we were told the other day by Air Services and their perfect bureaucrat that gave the evidence, beautiful job he did, um, that at the next Pacific Forum, which Senator Nash raised earlier, they were going to raise at the Pacific Forum the vagary of the transmission of the weather through New Zealand into this airspace. And is there a legal obligation on New Zealand to transmit that weather into that airspace? Uh, I understand there's not. My understanding, Senator, is that the situation in New Zealand very closely parallels the situation in Australia. The and the situation in Australia, as in the summary put out by air services, is that pilots are responsible for obtaining information necessary to make operational decisions and will not automatically receive routine TAF information showing deteriorating weather conditions if they are en route to a location. And that's the position of both Australia as publicly published and as we understand it, New Zealand. So if I'm flying from Mount Isa to Sydney and it's all turned to custard, um, it's not Sydney's obligation to tell uh, me it's all turned if to custard. You're, if you're within 
an hour of Sydney Senator, mm -hmm. then the availability of it, the, the fact of the availability of an amended TAF is information that should be provided to yeah, you. But so, so I'm on my way to Norfolk and the mm -hmm. weather's turned to custard. New Zealand knows it's turned to custard and I'm an hour out or an hour and a half out from New Zealand's controlled airspace uh, over Australia's land space. Mm, Are they legally obliged to tell me? No. Uh, in your turn to custard um, situation, um, there's a, a level of responsibility, Senator. The situation was that there was an updated forecast at the time that this flight was approximately three hours out and in Fijian airspace. By the time they were in New Zealand airspace, that was the extant forecast. So from the point of view of New Zealand, they're saying we have a forecast. We have an extant forecast, not a new forecast, and there's no requirement to deal with it. Yes, if there had been an updated forecast, so then they would have made that aware and been but required to But they weren't aware, aware that the weather... I, I understood they were aware the weather had deteriorated. Uh, yeah, but it changed. Mm. No, no, hang, hang on. Just, there was hang, hang on. The pilot came through and said, thank you. Just give me a go. Do I have to? I, I, I un yeah, unfortunately. Um, I understand the difficulty, Mr Allen, of all of this. But I further understand that New Zealand had information which would have been invaluable to the pilot if it had it got to uh, New Zealand so, had... So, so just... And what I want to know is, was New Zealand legally obliged to let the pilot know that he was going to fly into a custard pie, you know, into deteriorating weather? Um, I'm having troubles answering the question because that doesn't reflect the actual circumstances, Senator. Uh, we, the, we may give you time to reflect. <laughs> understand, Senator, short duty calls. So, so could I just mm. call a short suspension? I apologise. We're probably voting to end the world as we know it.
Stay on behalf of yourself. Thank you. In resumption, are we ready up the back there? Thank you. Um, no, no, you're right. Don't panic. C could, could you assist Mr Dale and the committee by giving us the date upon which the decision in ATSB was taken to downgrade the report from intolerable to broadly acceptable? The risk? Um, Take that on notice, if I'll you like. Take that on notice, Senator. Could you um, also take on notice the date of the transfer of the chief pilot of Pell Air to CASA? Uh, you can find that out for us. We'll ask CASA, Senator, and do it again. Well, but, you know. Uh, and jurisdictionally, can they ask that of, of another agency? We can, un we can, can we can undertake, Senator. Anyhow, uh, they won't tell you. I can't. They, they clear, won't tell you. They will. closely collaborate, so maybe this can be another. Um, it might be similar to ask Cassie directly, though, wouldn't it? I think it I might be, Senator, but we'll, we'll do what we can to facilitate. Uh, could I suggest, Senator, if I were to ask CASA to provide the information direct to the committee? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> or the committee could ask it directly. got so many questions, so little time, so... Oh, yeah, you'll be right. Um, the other one I wanted was the circular. <clears throat> Wait. Thank you, Chair. D didn't Unicom tell New Zealand twice about the weather by phone? I don't know. You said something about it. Uh, checking the report, Senator. Right. Um, Mr Sankson, while you're looking mm. at that, you said that you, you've been in this position for six months. At the time, you were in the position for six months? Yeah, um, it was November, the accident, Senator, and I think I started in the position in the June or July. Okay, but you've been with the ATSB for how Since many years? 2002. 2002, so you've been in, in, and you've had a number of senior positions leading up to that. Uh, team manager position and then the general manager position. Yes, Senator. Sure, okay, I just wanted to clarify that because there was, just clear up, there might be an ambiguity that you're only fresh into the ATSB for six months, whereas, uh, Mr Dolan, I know your position, you were, you know, you started fresh in the organisation, um, not but, so long. Yeah. I had responsibility <coughs> yeah, yeah. for the organisation, Senator. Yes. Yeah, that's right. All right. Perhaps you could take on notice, Mr Sankston, whether Unicom told New Zealand twice about the weather by phone and whether it was passed on, because my understanding is that that information was not passed on. <coughs> is that okay, Mr Sankson? Yeah, take I'm that on notice. I'm, I'm just running, trying to I'm speed down. through a few questions. Secondly, uh, Mr Dolan, have you read the Hansard of Monday the 19th of November of uh, Air Services Australia? Have you had an opportunity to I read I haven't read the Hansard. I did uh, watch... Uh, Air services give evidence on the day, so I have a recollection right, of the so, so, so you have a recollection of the issues. Mm -hmm. Air Services Australia, and they'll get back to us on this, have said that they, uh, uh, they, they will tell us when they, were when they had communications with the ATSB, but as a matter of course, in something like this, did ATSB communicate with Air Services Australia at a stage prior to, the prior to your report being made public? Uh, not that I'm aware of, Senator, but we can check, you take that nice check the details and see what communication there may have been with their services. But, but the given of what appears to be uh, critical issues, important issues with respect to um, uh, Air Services Australia and, the, and its ma potential material impact in terms of what occurred here, the outcome, wouldn't it have been prudent for the ATSB to communicate with Air Services Australia in respect to these matters? And it's a, it's a matter that... I think Senator Heffernan was uh, quite alive to on on Monday. Uh, I'm happy to take the question on on that, Senator, and give you that information. Well, um, from a policy but, point of view, do you think um, SS however, Australia would be relevant uh, to, to contact? The 
from the way we were understanding and reviewing the issues um, that were in play in this investigation, uh, we took as the starting point the existing regulatory provision that it's responsibility of flight crews and pilots in command to seek various sorts of information. Um, so we were more interested in what the AIP said than in what provisions may have been in place with air traffic providers to provide information. And what we determined was that what's in the AIP and elsewhere in terms of expectations of pilots and how they use information is not as adequate as it could be, and that's why we focus on that area in our report. So, so we didn't see this up. as primarily an air yeah. traffic control issue, Senator. We saw it as an AIP guidance to pilots issue. Okay, and you're saying, and you're saying there was a responsibility uh, that, that the AIP was relevant was a relevant issue. Yes, sir. So can we go to to issues of uh, of the AIP? Um, and and this is something that was raised by Senator Fawcett uh, at uh, at the hearing in October, and I think Senator Heffernan is well aware of this. There was an email from a senior CASA official on Saturday the 20th of March 2010, sent to another senior CASA official about this incident. And it's, and you're familiar with that email? Uh, no, Senator, okay. but I'm, I've, oh, sorry, I'm familiar with the discussion that occurs in this All committee right, well, about I that email. Just read it yeah, I'm happy with the path you're taking. My point is, and you're addressing it, that as a result of the reliance on the AIP, which has no head of power, and contains much that we need to revisit anyway, there is one group of pilots that have one view which leads to a mandatory diversion and another group with the opposite view. Putting aside the practicalities, both groups believe they are legally correct. Second paragraph. If we find ourselves in an AAT or a court, we once again look a bit foolish if we, the regulator, find ourselves in a position where we have to say there are two <coughs> conflicting views one of which has to be wrong, and we have done nothing to rectify that over the years. Very untidy. Does that refresh your memory in relation to that? I can remember the discussion and listening to that discussion in front of this committee, Senator. Do you see that as, as significant? I see that as an issue that's taken up in the safety factor and safety issue we identified. The available guidance on fuel planning and on seeking and applying on route weather updates was too general and increase the risk of inconsistent in-flight fuel management and decisions to divert. Yes, but can I just intervene, Senator? Please do. You wrote, as I understand it, we've got the correspondence, to Catherine and said, we think this is a critical incident, which is an intolerable risk. Yes, Senator. In the meantime, this discussion took place internally with CASA. Yes, Senator. And after this discussion took place in CASA, they wrote back to you and said, hey, we don't think this is an intolerable risk. Yes, Senator. Wow. Yeah, but in following on from there too, but it's appearing for anyone listening out there that the officers at the table weren't capable of making a decision. Because when you, well, you know, what, no, for people listening out there, I may have just tuned in. Hang on, hang on, just to correct you. The evidence upon which they based the intolerable risk uh -huh. yeah. has not changed. No, OK. But now, to give the officers a chance, because I'd like to... No, no, I'm not putting these bikes in the gun. Well, you're not putting them on a pedestal saying that no, they're no, absolutely... No, no, I am. I am. Fantastic. No, no, hang on. In all, can, in I, all I, fairness... I, chair, you, you don't have to be in smart all to work fairness, out what Big pardon? You don't have to be very smart to work out what happened, but well, go on. Just in all fairness... OK, there's, there's some assumptions around. Now, if that's not the case, what made you change your mind to, to shift from... What's the wording? Well, you, what's the word? We'll get the correspondence. Well, well maybe the officers... Intolerable risk. Intolerable. Yeah, OK, to so maybe the officers may be able to tell us. Yeah, you know, let Senator Sewell... Back to... Well, no, hang on, hang on. Senator Sewell finish his I don't want to interrupt Senator Sewell. I just... Yeah. Are you done? Yeah. So you don't want... Well, well, hang on. I think it's critical that we... No, 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 I'm not trying to interrupt you. I'm just saying... Well, he started it. <laughs> you might. I'm you just trying to get the answers. Senator Stoll, finish your question. What changed? Uh, Senator, 
at the initial stage, and as I say in my assessment, we were probably over the top in saying it was critical, but be that as mate, that's what we said. Yep. Uh, the, the process of investigation is to establish clearly, based on the evidence and its analysis, what the issues are. This remained an issue that was the subject of the investigation, and as we clarify those issues and understand them, put them in draft reports and in final reports, and understand what action has been taken in response, we shift our assessment of what the residual or underlying risk is. There's a process in terms of how we do investigations that reassesses over time the significance of an issue and how we view it. So, and that's essentially what happened in this case. And we've ended up with the safety issue as it stands in the report. But, now. But We're going to have time. We're going to have time. I just want to go somewhere now. Mm -hmm. What? No. Don't, no, sorry. Don't can I just ask a question on yeah, notice? On. Just on notice. On. Thank you for that. But you didn't really answer Senator Stirl's question. Can you take on notice for us? Given, as Senator Heffernan has so clearly pointed out, that the evidence didn't change, what specifically changed your view that changed the risk from intolerable to acceptable? So if you could provide that yeah. on notice specifically. And, and the only comment I would make, and I'm happy to provide details on, on that, Senator, is while the evidence relied on initially didn't change, we did acquire additional evidence and we were assessing and analysing the evidence. Okay, well, right. could you also but include what the additional was evidence but, was? But the independent... Okay. So, just, Chair, so yeah. just so I can clearly get this on record to take on notice, so, so then on that basis, can you also include what the additional evidence was? Yes, Senator. Okay. That's shone a light on for me. And, and so the okay. that person standing at the back of the room there has an independent view of all this. Chair, can I just follow on directly from... Uh, unless you were head of subject. Yeah, yeah just, just on your... Because I was about to do what you're doing yeah, on, the, on, the, on the... On the, on the email about, mm, boys, we better get our act together because we've got a difference of opinion. Well, it, it goes more than that, Chair. It actually talks about I'm, potential legal liability. I'm, I'm going to come to it. Hmm. So this is the person who directs all this, and you're going to give us the date for which the chief pilot of Pell Air, who found to be somewhere between involved in an <coughs> a, a, uh, intolerable risk <coughs> incident and a broadly acceptable risk, I will be interested to see whether during all this repositioning and this email here on the 20th of March at 15.50, internally, the, you, you can't tell me like any normal person, I'm not saying I'm normal, um, that transferred across from, as the chief pilot, to the policeman's side of it, wouldn't have had to say anything. Just having a cup of tea and winking and nodding you can communicate, you don't have to leave a paper trail. This, this organisation has the audacity, this is CASA and the boss, to send out an internal memo which says, do not be dismayed by our vocal but largely uninformed minority of critics. You may not be described as a critic, but you did say this is an intolerable proposition which they said, beg your pardon, we don't think it is, so that could make you a critic of CASA. They are symptomatic of other ills in society. I prefer facts, I presume you deal with facts, when engaged in discussions, I presume you, when you have discussions, you deal with facts, not hearsay and tautological rubbish. Um, I mean, this is very, very... Um, out there on the edge of the ice skating rink, in my view, for that sort of an internal memo, which I think could be quite intimidatory of witnesses and people with whom they are dealing, including yourselves, if that's the mindset of the boss, I think that's what I would call bullying in Chair, the Chair, in gathering of evidence. Long stretch there. Back to you. You've got something can that's I, put in our private just... meeting this morning, and, and I don't think it's fair to throw that. Can well, I just, at the, the, at the officers the from ATS, but you know. The facts that, back to you. Can, uh, can I, my, maybe just on what you've just said, uh, Chair, and uh, what you, Senator Still said, maybe we can have a shorter bow. You've heard the comments uh, attributed to uh, uh, Director McCormick. Um, is that the sort of attitude you take to this inquiry? I'm here because I understand, Senator, that I and my organisation are accountable to the Parliament 
and I'm happy to provide any information and support I can to the committee so they can understand what we did. Could you imagine sending an internal an internal memo a newsletter to your to your staff in similar terms? No, I don't think you have to answer that. No, you don't have to. Uh, it, the only thing I, I think I can usefully say, Senator, and I have no wish to make any commentary on, on the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, <coughs> is that my staff are very interested in uh, what this committee is doing, and they have <coughs> asked me, and I have said, it is we will provide all the information necessarily and sure. we will help the process we, of the we committee. We greatly appreciate Yeah, and, 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 and Mr Dollar, I, I, like the Chair, I genuinely appreciate the attitude you've taken. Uh, well, we're having a loving committee. Take along because yes, we're we running out of time. Thank you. Thanks for the reality. Oh, sorry, so back to you with questions. Sorry. Okay. Let's go back to this email of CASA uh, that between two senior officials of the 20th of March 2010, where issues of legal liability were raised, uh, where there are with the with the the uh, uh, that uh, you have two two different points of view that seems to be 50, split 50-50 amongst the the CASA. Uh -huh. uh, flying operations uh, uh, instructors or uh, officers. Mm -hmm. Were you aware of that at the time you prepared your report or that particular email? No, Senator. Do you consider it to be contain material information? Uh, we consider it to contain the same information that we got through our own inquiries of various pilots as to what they would have done in this sort of circumstance where Okay. Considerably varied, which is why we're saying there is an right. issue here. So let's be, let's be quite forensic and specific about this. This particular email is essentially saying that 50% of CASA's flying inspectorate are split on the available guidance, and the substitution <coughs> test says, and my, it is, isn't it reasonable to, to assume that the substitution test says that the pilot in this accident was not alone in his decision making. Do you agree with that? Uh, Yes, Senator. Uh, there's a but, range but, of... But, but were you aware yeah. that in terms of CASA's own flying inspectorate that there was such a massive split between what the appropriate thing to do was in terms of diversion or not? No, Senator. And you consider that significant? Uh, what I say, Senator, is that the split reflects the split that we understand to be the case of a range of pilots who, when we put this scenario to them, had different views on what they would do. And when were you which aware? Which is why. Sorry, when were you? We, yeah, when we were you aware of that split? Uh, the, which split? The, Senator, well, the very the general split we're one. talking about the split uh, between report, between um, mandatory diversion and another group with the opposite view, uh, as referred to in the email. The, I'm sorry, Senator. Well, the email says there is one group mm. of pilots that have one view which leads to a mandatory diversion and another group with the opposite view. In other words, presumably continue powering along to Norfolk mm. Island. And we're not talking about yeah. general pilots, we're not talking about students. We are talking about CASA's flying inspectorate. Yeah. Were you aware that CASA's flying inspectorate had such a divergent, had a split view on this? No, but what we were aware of, and, and, and so in our report, Senator, is the guidance increase the risk of inconsistent in-flight fuel management and decisions to divert. We are aware that this is an issue and, and, so and that we're saying that it requires clarification. To assist the committee in the investigations you, you made independently of CASA of mm -hmm. pilots? Yes, Senator. And they were not CASA pilots, they were... Other pilots. How many? Uh, they, pilots. they were split too. Mostly two. ATPL students, as I, I believe, who are very well, familiar well, with, well, with this. Well, this, we're talking about yeah. ATPL students, but mm. not CASA inspectorate. Uh, no, Senator, we we didn't see a need to talk to the CASA inspectorate on this well, sorry, particular issue. Sorry, flying issue. inspectorate, the CASA flying inspectorate. Uh, we were trying to understand how the pilot community in general viewed the existing guidance in relation to acquisition and use of on-flight information, including weather information, to make decisions to manage the flight and potentially to divert. So, but your information was collected from trainee pilots, or not? Uh, there was at least one exercise we did to do that, Senator. We also uh, talked to pilots in our organisation and various other things. We had some internal debates, and what was clear is that there were different interpretations of the available guidance, and this was an issue that needed to be dealt with. Why would you not go to the CASA Flying Inspectorate? Probably wouldn't let you. Uh, we went to CASA to ask CASA's view, and mm -hmm. we would normally leave it to CASA to work out among themselves what the CASA but view so, is. So CASA didn't provide you, clearly just so we can get this on the record, CASA didn't provide you with that information that Senator Xenophon's been referring to in that email? 
Yeah. Uh, no, okay. sir. They provided us with a response to the safety issue, which we had regard to in determining how to take it forward. But, but, but oh, sorry, Chair, this is, yeah. this is, yeah. I think this is absolutely critical. That email, which uh, we had to, you know, sift through and, and dig through the, the many thousands of documents, actually says, I mean, you know, the, the alarm bells are off because it talks about we'll find, we might find ourselves in an AAT or a court, we'll look a bit foolish as a regulator, if it, we as a regulator find ourselves in a position where we say there are two conflicting views, one of which has to be wrong. And we have done nothing to rectify that over the years, very untidy. Now, you interviewed uh, ATPL students, is that right? Yes. And a number of other pilots in industry, and Senator. how many? Uh, I think there was a sample of eight. Eight? I think. And we also examined a number of um, operators, operations manuals as to what guidance was... Is that included in your final report? Yes, Senator. Right. Including the background analysis and the interviews? Including the... Sorry? The, the, the interviews themselves? Uh, not specifically interview by interview, Senator. Right. right. Perhaps you could provide that in terms of the interviews that were undertaken. That might be useful in terms of the background before you reach that conclusion. Uh, as to the, in that case, Senator, and I... It's, this is not... We don't need to know the names of the students, we just want um, to... My only comment, Senator, would be that this is at the heart of the Restricted Information Provisions in our Act, so we want that information to be treated confidentially by the committee. Well, hang on. If we don't know who it is, if it's not going to identify the pilots and it shows divergent views, how is that restricted information? It, it's acquired, it? Senator, in the course of our investigation okay. and I comes under... OK, I, fair enough, fair enough. OK. We'll take it in camera. But... but, but but you agree that ATPL students wouldn't have the same level of expertise as CASA FOIs? Uh, the reason that we picked ATPL students is that these are the people that have just been through the training to learn how to make these sorts of decisions. So we, were, we had a fresh group that had a, a sense of what was at issue and what was clear was there were differing views as to what should be done in this circumstance and we backed that up Mr. with Donnelly, interviews what do, of what others. Do you, what do you make of this, that there's reference made on an email on a Saturday, the 20th of March 2010, saying if we find ourselves in an AAT or a court, we could look a bit foolish, worse that effect. Do you read anything to the fact that Dominic James's AAT hearing was first set down for the 23rd of March 2010? Um, I'm not sure that that's anything I can usefully comment. It doesn't go to my, my function or, or okay. what I'm trying to explain to this committee, Senator. But given, given that, and I'm conscious of, of time constraints, given that this material, this email of the 20th of March between two CASA officials was not provided uh, to you in the course of your investigation, my questions are these. Firstly, do you consider it would have been helpful to the ATSB's investigation to be aware of both the content and background of that particular email? Uh, I don't believe, Senator, it would have added anything to what we already knew, but which is that there is a serious division of views as to what the current guidance says and, what, and therefore there's a problem. It would have reinforced it, but we already knew there was a problem. <coughs> and, and the fact that one, one is a subset, one, one is CASA FOIs compared to students you don't put any additional weight on CASA FIs? Uh, I'd certainly uh, take account of the views of, of, of CASA FOI, Senator. What I'm saying, I, I hope clearly enough, is that what the CASA FOIs appear to be disputing is the very thing that we know that other pilots okay. were disputing. Now, CASA has said in relation to the AIP with respect to this that they intend, emphasis on the word intend, mm -hmm. to change it in 2014. Given what's occurred, do you consider that time frame to be reasonable? Uh, this goes to my opening remarks, Senator, uh, where I, I pointed out that the problem that we're dealing with here relates to a very particular circumstance where, a rare circumstance where a weather forecast turns out not to be reliable. Not, weather... not, not so rare on Norfolk Island, though. We heard from the Bureau of Meteorology on Monday. Not so rare. It's about 2.7% uh, of the time, isn't it? No, well, sir. In terms of accuracy? Uh, my understanding is it's somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8. It's about one six or eight in a thousand. And that's why I said uh, one or two a year. Uh, the, and we've done our own review of a range of material about the reliability of forecasts at Norfolk Island. The 
comparatively rare and only applying to essentially general aviation flights. Any passenger carrying charter or RPT flights in those circumstances are required to plan for fuel to get to destination, Norfolk Island, and then from there to an alternate. So while we think it's useful to clarify the AIP, the key step that's been taken is the one that says that passenger carrying aircraft, particularly aeromedical, will be required to carry the fuel to the destination and from there to an alternate. And that means that these sorts of difficult decisions about how much weather information do I need and how do I make a decision to divert and so on gets taken off the table. But going to the issue, and I know we ran out of time, when it was changed from a critical safety issue to a minor safety issue, um, <coughs> at what date did you receive communications or representations from CASA saying, well, we don't think it's a critical safety issue? Um, was it after this email of the 20th of March 2010 we'll, referred to? Yeah. yeah, we'll provide the correspondence, Senator, and you can, Work it out for you can check that. Yeah. Um, Chair, I have... Question. We'll, we'll be putting questions. some questions on notice. You may contribute, uh, Senator Zenith, onto that. Um, could I just, uh, and we're grateful for your patience. The, um, the committee, I think, would be interested to know exactly when <coughs> the ATSB requested the CASA special audit. You know, on what was the date of that and when did ATSB actually receive the document? Yes, Senator, we can, we can provide that information. So we'll, um, we'll have some questions that we will put on notice. Um, further questions? I just got, I just got one. <clears throat> I just got one and I haven't contributed, so if you'd uh, yeah. allow me. Um, your opening statement um, was full of conviction and, and we you s firmly stand behind your report. It was vastly different from your previous evidence where I think, I've, in fact, you said on two occasions that you weren't proud of the report. I um, only recall one, Senator, but I did say that, yes. Yes. Um, what's changed that you're standing behind the report now, one in which you're not proud of? Um, but well, I, you've, you've muscled up since we saw you last. That's his interpretation. Um, Senator, I believe it was your question about whether if, if my recollection is correct, uh, as to whether we were proud of the report. What I should have said by way of context is what we're not proud of is how long it took us to complete this report. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we're not. Uh, the, the second is, at the time we were previously before the committee, there was a range of assertions and evidence and other things directly challenging a whole range of dimensions of our report that we hadn't had the opportunity to fully consider, to test against the information we had to respond to. Mm. And so if we seemed a little tentative, it was because mm. there was a lot of apparently unanswered questions sitting yeah. on the table. Mm. We've spent a lot of effort in actually yeah. analysing all that information in responding to it. And my fellow, I and my fellow commissioners have reviewed that material. And that's why we say with confidence, we stand by our report. And subsequent to that, and since the hearing that we last had, have you had meetings within your bureau, uh, your division, uh, as to how you'll change things so that this never happens again? Uh, I've, for almost all my time in the organisation, Senator, been, as Mr Sangston and Mr Walsh can, can <coughs> tell you, have been very insistent that we substantially improve uh, the way the, the timeliness of our reports. It's been a point of criticism, and what I have said is that for most reports, we aim to complete them in less than a year, and in most circumstances, we're hitting that target. Um, it comes and it goes depending on how much work we have on hand. So, and we will continue to do that. Uh, we are currently building a whole range of investigation management tools to make it easier to manage them as defined projects, to set clear scopes, clear resourcing, 
clear time frames for completion so we can manage our resources better. And so we're putting a whole range of things in place to continue to, to, to manage that challenge. So are you prepared to share those recommendations or memos about how you'd like to change the culture or the way in which you operate with this, with uh, this committee? Is there anything out there formally? Well, I, I can show you over time, Senator, how we've set much tighter targets for completion of our reports. I can show you the things... No, no, that just specifically in this, in this last month. Uh, I'd, I'm trying to think, other than exactly. reminding staff, Senator, that... Um, no worries. Uh, no, I don't, take it on notice. I'll take it on notice, right. except to say, Senator, I don't, I don't think we've done anything specific other than having a discussion at the executive level about what we learned from this. And what I said to the staff is one of the things we've learned from this is timeliness remains a very important thing for Time our organisation. So, story. Mr Wallace, you've got out of this rather lightly, <coughs> and you are the strategic capability general manager. Um, the New Zealand reporting arrangement, Air Services said they're going to raise it at the Pacific Forum in six months' time. I don't know how often they have Pacific Forums, but if someone that I knew was on the plane, I'd have raised it a bloody lot earlier. They think there's some need for improvement of the way the weather's reported in that particular airspace. Do you think there is, for ATSB that you have the strategic capability to do something about that? Uh, I think it might be a mis misunderstanding as to what my role as the general manager of strategic capability. It's about providing um, capacity within the organisation to do its tasks. So my role is actually looking after the, the notifications and confidential reporting function, aviation research, technical analysis, that's uh, engineering um, evaluations and recorded analysis, so flight data recorders, but, but those types of things. Wouldn't that involve w um, making sure plans get the weather? Uh, well, that's a matter. It's, it's an investigation matter that's part of the investigation we process. We still haven't got the answer in my head about what is the legal responsibility of those people in New Zealand to let people flying into Norfolk Island know about the weather? Yeah. A... Um, we've got information on that, Senator, from New Zealand and from Australia. Uh, I think we need to have discussions with our colleagues in air services to understand better what seems to be a slightly different view on our part about what's required from what they believe is the case. And once we've got that, we'll have a better view as to how much we will be urging them to raise matters. So if we went into forum. camera now, would you tell us what you think? Uh, I don't think it makes any difference whether I so say it in camera So will you tell us here what you think, what the difference is? Uh, as I said earlier, Senator, and I'm happy to table this document, um, that's part of a pilot brief on called Safety yeah, Net on the Air Services pilot website. Pilot responsibility, yeah. Pilot responsibilities for obtaining information mm. in flight, which sets out something that's pretty much consistent with what's in the AIP and we believe is so, broadly so, so consistent with what's so in New Zealand. I can't guarantee quorum, quorum because I've been patient question. and I'm going yeah. to have to... You're going to have to go to the toilet. I no, no, no. I'm being more than fair, Senator. Yeah, right. So I can't. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 the hand yeah. side, there'll be no quorum in about two minutes. Yeah, right. So, sorry, Chair, and I'm really conscious that we've gone over time and... and can I just go to the issue of the special, the request for the special order, uh, CASA special order? Mm -hmm. That was only requested on the 4th of July this year by the ATSB, is that right? Uh, that would sound about right, Senator, yes. Were you aware that there was a special order? Uh, yes, Senator. Prior to the 4th of July? Yes, Senator. And you didn't, and what, at roughly what time period were you aware of that special order? Uh, because we have regular meetings with okay. CASA to talk about various information, we would have been aware of it at the time that they kicked it off. Okay. And you didn't think it was relevant for the purpose of your report to obtain a copy of that special order? Uh, our focus, Senator, was on the en route side of this. And no, no, no. Your brief is much made. wider than that, Mr I, Dolan. I know. We, we scoped our investigation in that way, Senator. And... 
So we didn't see that there was direct significance in the regulatory exercises that CASA was undertaking, either in relation to the pilot or in relation how to would you, How would you know, Mr Dolan, without actually seeing the special audit report? Uh, what its significance would be or otherwise? We were trying to understand, Senator, what might need changing in the existing rule set that CASA regulates. CASA was giving force to its responsibilities of ensuring that the existing rule set is complied with. And that's the difference between us as an investigator and CASA as the regulator. So we're not seeing that it was directly relevant. Uh, but, but sorry, how do you know whether it's directly relevant or not if you haven't actually seen the audit report, the special audit report? Uh, how would you know that? We see our job, Senator, as a different job to CASA. And so a special audit was in relation to CASA's views about how uh, Pell Air complied with regulatory provisions, and that's their responsibility as the regulator. We wanted to understand what risks existed in the system as it stood that needed attention and were ongoing risks to safety, and we did that through our investigation and the material we acquired. But, but, but Mr Dolan, a special order report, given what you've conceded, could that not contain information that could go to systemic issues, the sorts of issues that were raised very well by Senator Fawcett at, a pre, at the previous inquiries, couldn't that have been relevant for the purpose of the ATSB's final report? Uh, that is possible, Senator, and the only point I'd make um, in response to this is the broad context in which we were undertaking our investigation, which is that we re there were a range of things if we want to go to Professor Reason's model of investigation, although we think we've come a long way since Professor Reason's initial work in the 1990s, that there's error and there's violation. And while the focus of our investigations is on error and understanding error, how to prevent it, how to detect it, how to deal with its consequences, there was also an element in this case of what in Professor Reason's model would be viewed as violation. And that is principally a responsibility of the regulator. So could I just clarify something? I, we're gonna have to wind up and we're grateful. In your last report, well, we'll come back to you in a sec. In your last report to us, which is in recent days, you do acknowledge that there are several points of that special report that you did take note of, is that correct? Uh, there were several points in that special audit where we already had in our investigation um, highlighted, so it highlighted the same issues that we had already determined in our investigation. Back to you, Senator Zenefon. We'll Two questions, I know we're running out of time. Ms Dolan, isn't the ATSB supposed to be looking at CASA in its investigation? Isn't that part of it? You're supposed to look at the regulator. That's part of your job, yes or no? Uh, in... I'm sorry, Senator, it's not a yes or no answer. It depends on the context of an individual investigation. OK, so you could potentially be looking at CASA in terms of its regulations and the way it regulates... Correct, Senator. Say, OK, fine. The second thing is this, second and finally, the ATSB 19th of October 2012 Annex A submission of the ATSB mm -hmm. are where the final report has included the special audit findings considerations in the final report. Isn't that impossible in the sense that the 28th of March 2012 draft has the exact material you are quoting word for word from which you uh, say you did after receiving the special audit in July of this year? I, I mean, I'm, just, I'm just confused about time frames as to as to what you actually relied on at what time, because there seems to be an inconsistency with the Annex A submission in terms of time frames. Um, I'm sorry, Senator, I'm not... OK. I, it, it may be the hour, but I, I'm no, not sure no, I've quite may, understood your I question. I haven't explained it very well. Same. What? Yeah. Don't worry, we're all sitting here thinking... <coughs> no. Just, just put it again. In, in, the, in the sense that in, in the 19th of October Annex, you, uh, the, the, your final report has included the special audit, audit findings, considerations. You, you say that you've, in, you've made reference to the special audit in your final report, is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct, Senator. But in terms of your, uh, in terms of the earlier drafts of this report, there is, uh, you wouldn't have actually, it seems to be identical conclusions. So 
your report hasn't, in fact, changed in any way as a result of CASA's special audit? That's correct, Senator. OK. I hope that clears it up. Thank you very much. Uh, we will call a, a uh, stop to today's proceedings and we are once again most grateful for ATSB and their evidence and their dedication. Um, and uh, thank you to the linesmen and ball boys and our professional staff and the committee and um, we'll come back another day. Right.